welcome to the magnificent Guildhall in the City of London, where we await the announcement of the winner of one of the world's leading literary prizes, the Man Booker. It's been quite a journey to get to this point. 151 books were considered. They were whittled down to a long list of 13, then a short list of six, and tonight there will just be one book, one winner. All six of the shortlisted authors are here tonight, finishing off their dinner behind me in the Grand Hall. How much they're eating of it, I do not know. It must be rather nerve-wracking waiting to hear whether you've won and perhaps even starting to think about the £50,000 cheque that comes with winning. It's a landmark moment for the prize. After 45 years, the rules are changing. From next year, anyone writing any novel in English anywhere in the world will be eligible, and that means the Americans are coming. It's also a special year for the prize because, for the first time, we have a royal guest. Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall is here, and she will be presenting uh, the trophy to the winner. Well, I'm delighted to say that to help us guide us through the proceedings, I'm joined by two very distinguished guests, Sir Peter Stoddard, who is editor of the Times Literary Supplement, but also chairman of the judges last year, and Gabby Wood, head of books at the Daily Telegraph, and a judge the year before that. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, really looking forward to talking to you. But before we do, let's just remind ourselves of who is on this year's shortlist. We Need New Names by No Violet Bulawayo. The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton. Harvest by Jim Crace. The Lowland by Jumpa Lahiri. A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Azeki. And The Testament of Mary by Colm Tobin. very diverse shortlist, both in terms of the subjects are covered, but also the nationalities and backgrounds of the authors. And Peter, I wonder, first of all, just speaking generally about the shortlist, is it a strong year, do you think? Well, it's a wonderful tribute to the end of a, of a Booker era. I mean, that, 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 and that's one way, one way of seeing it. This is a Commonwealth Prize, and this is an extraordinary Commonwealth list with an amazing range of prose from different places in different styles. And you know, next year, the Americans are there. And if you see this as a great competition, which we should, backed by great argument, then it will then bring them on. Um, you know, I think we, the old book has shown you know, the, you know, some of the best of what it can offer. Gabby, you've written that this shortlist brought a tear to your eye. Was that through joy or sorrow? <laughs> Definitely joy, although slightly too sentimental, yes. It was, I found it incredibly invigorating. Not so much the span, well, including the span of, uh, you know, the global span of the authors, but really the quality of it, the range of it, um, the experiment involved. It seemed very exciting. Well, look, let's talk in details about each of the books. And let's start with the bookmaker's favourite, Jim Crace's Harvest. He's the elder yes. statesman on the list, isn't he? 67, he's been shortlisted once before. This is a book about dispossessed peasants forced from their homes as changes sweep across the English countryside. Is he a deserved favourite, Gabby, do you think? Yes, I mean, he does. It feels like he deserves He's also said that it's going to be his last book. I mean, that's always a good move. Or maybe it's not. <laughs> he might carry on I if he doesn't he win it. he might carry on. But anyway, <laughs> uh, what did you think of the book? I thought it was excellent. I mean, it, it seems to be set in the 16th century. I think it is set in the 16th century. Lots of clues sort of dappled here and there. But also, it spans a lot more time. And um, the, the nature of dispossession, I think, is his real interest. Um, and, and actually, more, more modern versions of that uh, our relationship to the land, um, appropriations, thefts of various sorts. I think it's very strong. Well, the other established, very established writer on the shortlist, of course, is the Irish writer Colm Tobin. This is the third time he's been shortlisted. Shortlisted this year for the Testament of Mary, which does this extraordinary thing of telling the story of Jesus' life and death from the point of view of his mother. But I suppose the most striking thing about it is its length. It's only, what, 101 pages. Should it be longer, Peter? No, no, if you're writing about the Virgin Mary, I think you, you can rely on the fact that people know the backstory and you're, you're <laughs> piling it up on brick, brick onto brick of, of what's been there before. Yeah. And Colto Beam is such an extraordinary prose writer that, frankly, every page stands for four. You know, every word he uses, there are five words behind it. He is the sort of virtuoso approach. He is the greatest writer in this hall. I'd, I'd be, 
that you could argue that in many ways. We haven't got time to do so, but he is, he is the virtuoso violinist, and it's, this is a virtuoso performance in the cause of an extraordinary act of subversion. So yes. virtuosity, subversiveness, those are powerful uh, elements in a, in, a, in, in a man book, uh, book and I would... Uh, he got the biggest cheer when he came up tonight. Yes, he did, he did, when he came up to, to receive uh, his shortlisted uh, uh, accolade. Um, Gabby, the other extreme is Eleanor Catton's book, The Luminaries, which is yes. a doorstop of a book, 860, 832 pages, I think. And this is a Victorian murder mystery set during the gold rush in New Zealand. And I suppose the obvious question is, is it worth its length? Doesn't I mean, is it that worth... Long? reading it well, uh, at that it, length. It's certainly worth reading. It's a slightly unfair comparison with Colin Tobum after all that praise for his uh, concision. Um, but it, it, it's a gripping read. I mean, yeah. you don't notice that it's 832 pages long. And also, I think it's, it's packaged in this sort of experimental framework, which disappears as soon as you start. So um, there, there's something misleading about calling it an experimental novel. Well, in fact, it's a sort of pacey, uh, sort of 19th century sensation novel, but also written by somebody who has had all that history behind them. Um, I think it's, um, well, I, I think if this were to win, it would be the boldest move. Interesting. Well, what about Noviolet Bulawayo? She would be, if she won, the first black South Af uh, black African woman to win. Uh, it's her debut novel, a story about a 10-year-old girl growing up in a shanty town in Zimbabwe who then moves to America. Um, I like the first part of the book. I thought it was wonderfully exuberant. I wasn't quite so sure about when she moved to America. What, well, what did a great, you think? It's a great contrast with the Catton, because yes. the Catton is a, is a miracle of artifice. It's the kind of work that I love as a classicist. It's an Alexandrian masterpiece, the, the Catton. Uh, the, the no Violet Bulawayo is raw observation of what you see in, in, in front of you. And the first 30 pages and the way in which um, she uses names to grip reality. And when the reality changes, she changes the names. So when they're doing some rather, a um, um, lot of unpleasant things are done to people, um, and they change the names, they use names for American TV shows, for American magazines, and, and that is a particular, that is something that Zimbabweans do. I was talking to people about here tonight. It is accurately observed, very, very vivid. Yes. But, of course, it doesn't have anything like the, the kind of art of, of, of the cat. Yes, but what about the Jumpa Lahiri book, The Lowland? Um, also actually about the immigrant experience, you could say, about two brothers, one uh, but born in India, one goes to live in Rhode Island, the other stays behind in Calcutta. Uh, did you enjoy that book? I did enjoy it. I, mean, I think the relationship between the two brothers is very moving, even though one of them doesn't last very long. No. Um, and I think it's fascinating on her part to have written a, a book with such a span, really, uh, over time, when... She started out and continues to be a short story writer um, of incredible concision and beauty, really, I yes. think. Yes. And finally, Peter, Ruth Ezeki's A Tale for the Time Being, uh, which intertwines the story of two women, uh, a Canadian writer called Ruth, uh, who finds a diary washed up on a yeah. beach, which has been written by a teenager in Tokyo. Did that intertwining work for you? The teenage diary is, is, is wonderful. And again, the opening part of that is a wonderful fem young female voice. The yes. fiction is all about voices, and those, and those are two great ones we talked about. The adult voice is, is less secure for me, and the un intellectual underpinning was a lot more frail, but then I'm not a Zen Buddhist, and she is. She is indeed, ordained in 2010. Well, look, we'll leave it there just for a second, um, because as I said... Um, there's a special guest here this evening, the Duchess of Cornwall, and uh, she got up and made a speech a little earlier on. She described herself as a passionate reader, and she talked about a literacy project in Middlesbrough, which is run by the Booker Foundation. As patron of the National Literacy Trust, I visited the UK's first literacy action hub in Middlesbrough, an area which is bearing the brunt of the economic decline. This groundbreaking project is addressing some of the worst literacy problems in the country by bringing people together from all parts of the community, including local government, business and charities, to create a major campaign to get Middlesbrough reading. The project already has had a huge impact and its success would not have been possible without the vital seed funding from the Booker Prize Foundation. 
Well, uh, before the dinner that's taking place behind me uh, did take place, there's a champagne reception for the 500 or so guests here this evening. And we caught up with some of them to, think, uh, to find out what they think about this year's shortlist and who they think is going to win. I, I would think in this particular case, I think Ruth has said, I would go for uh, Simply because, I mean, the wonderful thing about Luminary is it really heralds the, the, the advent of a, of a fantastic writer. Um, she will win it. I don't have the slightest doubt another time. She might win it tonight, I don't know. I think there are two writers on this list, Jim Crace and Colin Dubin, who both of whom deserve to win this prize. I think that, I know their work pretty well, and I think in neither case are these their best books. But I would be very happy to see either win. I would like to see Ruth Ozeki win the prize. I think her novel is very remarkable. It's very rich, very multi-layered. It creates a, a world that one inhabits as a reader with a real sense of, of reality. You end the novel. It's the case with all great novels, with a sense of regret that you've left those characters behind. You want to know more. And uh, if you feel hungry for a sequel, that's a mark of a good book. Well said. Well, the views there of uh, some of the guests who are here with us this evening. We're waiting for the formal part of the evening to uh, start. So, while we do wait, I'm going to put you both on the spot. Uh, Gabby, who do you think is going to win? Who do I think is going to? Who do I think should? You can answer both questions. <laughs> well, to be more Captain, I think. And Peter? Uh, Captain or no Violet Bulawaya. Okay, but so Captain, so. probably edgy. Really? OK, well, we shall see if you're right. Do stay with us. I'm now going to hand you over, I think, to the Chairman of the Judges, Robert McFarland. Thanks, uh, so Minister, for that resonant introduction. Good evening to you all. Ladies and gentlemen, feedback, uh, forgive me. Uh, so, it has been a long path to this point. We began our work in late November last year. It took us nine months subsequently to read 151 novels. I, I am a walker, uh, fond of walking, as uh, almost all people are, and so I, I am also fond of quantifying tasks in terms of distance. So my, my math tells me that we, walked uh, we, we read around 20 kilometers of prose as measured in 12-point Garamond. I am a Garamond man. I confess it here. Occasional bouts of the Cambrian, the odd fit of the wingdings, but mostly... Mostly Garamond. Um, it was an exhausting and a fascinating journey. Along the way, we met missionaries, scientists, priests, jihadists, mothers, brothers, fathers, siblings, mystics. We met many murderers, many, many murderers. And almost all of them had fancy prose styles, to borrow from uh, Vladimir Nabokov's famous line. We read sci-fi, spy-fi, cli-fi. We read litfic, histfic. We read dickfic. Detective fiction, a little of the other. We read Gumshoe, we read Scruble. We passed through landscapes of great, great strangeness. We were, by turns, amazed, saddened, bored, very bored, <laughs> confided in, and betrayed. The very best books we read reminded us of the peculiar powers of the novel as a form, among them to secure passage into regions of the mind otherwise inaccessible to examine the workings of memory and the makings of thought, and to use the postulatory power of fiction to illuminate, criticize, or repattern what we might consider to be the real. Uh, some of you will know, and I thought of it often, Milan Kundera's lovely little apothem about the novel. He says that the novel has knowledge as its only morality as a form. What does he mean by that? I think he means something along these lines, that true novels discover what only the novel can. Not the TV miniseries, not the newspaper column, not the historical essay. To survive and thrive, the novel must continue to discover what only the novel can discover. Those books that we have celebrated in our long list and our short list brilliantly fulfill Kundera's demand. Uh, before I turn to that short list, I must give thanks. I give thanks to Ian Truin, for his wise, quiet counsel throughout. He is the benign Thomas Cromwell of the Man Booker Prize. <laughs> Thank you to four Coleman Getty. Dottie Irving, Katie McMillan, Scott, Amy Barder, Lucy Hinton, and others have been models of imaginative efficiency. 
we have been generously supported throughout by the remarkable Manny Roman and by the Mann Group. And I am grateful, above all, to my fellow judges in whom I have been staggeringly fortunate. Uh, they are Robert Douglas Fairhurst, Natalie Haynes, Martha Carney, and Stuart Kelly. They have worked with an integrity and a diligence. Thank you. I haven't even finished my list, of, uh, but they are all virtues. A critical acuity as well. Uh, they have been faultless. We did also laugh a lot, I promise. Uh, to our shortlist now, then to our winner. So I take the novels in alphabetical order of author. No Violet Bulawayo's We Need New Names First. It's the only debut novel on our list, though you would be forgiven for thinking it was otherwise. It's a book that zings and sings with angry energy. Our narrator, as you know, is the irrepressible darling. She tells the story of her destitute childhood in Zimbabwe, her emigration to America, which should be a promised land, but of course, like all promised lands, turns out to be far from Edenic. Each chapter of this novel felt to us like a fresh adventure in language. Its violence and honesty, to borrow a phrase from the novel, shook us. Eleanor Catton's The Luminaries is set in the New Zealand gold, gold rush. It slowly but deeply staked its claim upon us. It is animated by this weird struggle between compulsion and conversion. Within its pages, men and women proceed according to their fixed fates, while around them gold, as bars, as nuggets, as flakes, as bullion, shifts its shapes. At 832 pages, it might seem like one of Henry James's big baggy monster novels. In fact, it's as intricately structured as an orrery. It requires a huge investment of time from the reader, but the dividends it offers are astronomical. Jim Crace's Harvest was among the very first novels that we read. It continued to haunt us through the many months of reading that followed. It tugged our sleeves. It nagged at our memories. It ghosted us in all sorts of ways. It describes the destruction, as you know, of a seven swift days of uncreation of an English village. A long settled way of life is disrupted by the incursion of capital. It's unlocatable in time and space. It's eerie and it's eldritch in its atmospheres. It refuses easy allegiance either to allegory or to parable. It is disturbing at the level of form. It is dazzling at the level of sentence. Jhumpa Lahiri's The Lowland is seismological in that it is concerned with the tremors and then, then the aftershocks of a traumatic event that is at its core. It's a novel about distance and separation, but also about the impossibility of leaving certain kinds of past behind, however far you move. Its patience is admirable. Its lucidity was impeccable. It works by increment. It gathers a terrible sadness over its length. Ruth Ezeki's wonderfully clever, vast-hearted novel, A Tale for the Time Being. It's a turbulent story of two parts. It's told in counterpoint. It's preoccupied with doublenesses and simultaneities. And in keeping with the quantum physics that animate it, wave and particle being at once the same, it somehow manages to be tender and refined, comic and grave, hopeful and desperate. We loved its spirits in several senses. We are all Hello Kitty fans now. <laughs> Lastly, Colin Tobin's The Testament of Mary. This is a spare, a fiercely compassionate novel about a mother's love for her son by one of the consistently finest stylists writing in English. It's barely 100 pages long. It has a compressed energy. This lost gospel possesses the power of a text many times its length. Its subjects are very contemporary though its story is ancient. Radicalization, interrogation, authoritarianism, the control of narrative. Who would have thought that one of the oldest and the best known of the world's stories could have been made modern in this manner? These are six extraordinary novels. It has been a huge pleasure to us to watch the reception of the shortlist worldwide and the acclaim that the books have already received. It has not been easy to choose a winner. Of course, though, we have done so. And the winner of the 2013 Man Booker Prize for Fiction is The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton.
When I began writing The Luminaries, I was very much in the thrall of Lewis Hyde's wonderful book, The Gift, as I still am. And his conception of the creative enterprise as explored in that book was very important to me in how I came to understand the west coast of the South Island of New Zealand during the years of the gold rush. The region is rich in two very different minerals, gold, prized by Europeans for its value, and greenstone or punamu, prized by the Māori for its worth. Gold, being pure currency, can only be bought and sold. Punamu is a symbol of belonging and prestige, can only be given. An economy based on value in Lewis Hyde's conception is not necessarily inferior to an economy based on worth. But the, but the two must somehow be reconciled in the life of an artist who wishes to make a living by his or her gift, by his or her art. On the West Coast, this intersection of economies has a national significance, speaking as it does to New Zealand's essentially bicultural heart. I am very aware of the pressures upon contemporary publishing to make money and to remain competitive in a competitive world. And I know that it is no small thing that my primary publishers, Granta here in London and Victoria University Press in New Zealand, never once made these pressures known to me while I was writing this book. I was free throughout to concern myself with questions not of value, but of worth. This is all the more incredible to me because The Luminaries is and was from the very beginning a publisher's nightmare. The shape and form of the book made certain kinds of editorial suggestions not only mathematically impossible, but even more egregious, astrologically impossible. A very sensible email from one of my two editors, Sarah Holloway or Max Porter, might have even earned the very annoying and not at all sensible reply, well, you would think that, being a Virgo. <laughs> I am extraordinarily fortunate in having found a home at these publishing houses and to have found friends and colleagues and people who have managed to strike an elegant balance between making art and making money. To everybody at Granta, and at Victoria University Press back home. Thank you. I would also like to make some very brief but heartfelt individual thanks to my editors, Sarah Holloway and Max Porter, whose influence on the luminaries has been conspiratorial, rigorous, and for me, incredibly personally sustaining. To my publishers, Fergus Barrowman, Philip Gwynne Jones, and Sigrid Rousing, who were kind enough to take a chance on me, and to my dear agent, Carolyn Dorney, in whom I trust completely. I must also thank my beloved, Steve Toussaint, whose kindness, patience, and love is written on every page of my book. Lastly, I would like to thank the Man Booker Prize and this year's judging panel for considering my work alongside the work of such wonderful and important writers as Novaila Bulawayo, Jim Crace, Jhumpa Lahiri, Ruth Lezeki, and Kong Toy Bean, and also for providing the value and the worth jointly of this extraordinary prize. Thank you. Man Booker Prize with her book, The Luminaries, and to hand it to our guests here, the former judges Gabby Wood and Peter Sotard, you both tipped her. A bold choice, but a good one. From their hard work of reading is going to go into people. This, <laughs> that, I mean, Manny Roman, the sponsor, talked about the Alexandrian Library. It is a book about difficulty. This is a book that is great artifice and will test a lot of people, but well worth the test. Yes, and you, it's just heavy, it's not difficult. <laughs>
<laughs> Happy to lug around. Yeah. Well, look, we're so grateful to you both. Thank you for breaking off from your dinner to talk to us, Peter Stoddard and Gabby Wood. And there you have it, as I say, Eleanor Catton, the winner of the 2013 Man Booker Prize for Fiction, and she makes history. She's become the youngest person at the age of 28 ever to win the prize. From all of us here at the Guildhall, many thanks for watching. A very good night.